so I'd like to thank, first of all, all of you for staying so late. Uh, I think uh, the, the day was, was very fruitful in terms of, uh, of the different talks we had. Uh, so now uh, we're going to start the panel uh, related to, to various uh, questions uh, concerning mathematics and ICT and how uh, uh, mathematics can impact ICT. So um, maybe I'll start by a question very um, fast, and then maybe I'll give you, uh, um, uh, I mean, you can start speaking and, 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 and maybe animate this panel. The first thing is, is as you know, Huawei has established a close collaboration with the uh, ESUS, and we're very happy with that. And um, the, the main issue that, um, um, and I would like to have your feedback, is between, I would say, the long-term research that mathematics require to get into new ideas, and I would say the short-term perspective in which industry, especially the ICT industry, is implicated. So what's your advice in terms, as far as, uh, as we are concerned, with the math uh, lab here in Paris, how do you see the effort that has to be made with respect to the, the long-term perspective that the mathematics require in terms of innovation and the short-term applications that the industry is requiring? When you see how industry is evolving, um, you have new phones nearly every six months to one year. And uh, basically, how do you see this uh, different temporal timescales between, I would say, the fundamentals, uh, the required, I would say, time to evolve and produce new ideas, and the applications behind? So I don't know who wants to talk first. No, I want to, to ask a question back to you. The question back to you, Mirwan, because yes, you said a, a, phone, a new phone every six months or whatever, but in your speech, you said five years to develop a new technology like for 4G or 5G and 20 years to use it. So it looked like 25 year uh, cycle. This looks like long term to me. Very good question. So you're, you're totally right. You're totally right. So uh, within our lab, and I have to explain, we have what we call um, research-oriented project and what we call product-oriented projects. And these product-oriented projects are more like a supporting effort uh, related to mostly, uh, I would say, not those five years perspective. So whenever you do research in a company-wise, you have some long-term perspective, of course, and more, I would say, short-term perspective where you need to produce and help the company in producing some results. So in what I showed, of course, in even 20 years, um, there's always evolutions of the technologies. You don't just sit down and wait 20 years. So even when I was talking about five years in between, you really have to make the technology evolve. So for example, as you know, you have 4.5G, 4.6G, 4.7G before the 5G is arriving. Okay. So that was my response. Uh, I, I was having conversation with Stefan uh, a couple of hours before, which was telling something precisely about short term, long term, and the impact on training for for students that may be uh, relevant in this discussion. My first uh, reaction when you talk about uh, long term uh, organizational long term is what about the training? You know. Uh, you train the student and then he will be or she will be active in research for or research and industry for whatever, for 30, 40 years. So if the person is well trained, then you may have long term uh, success, uh, badly trained and, and nothing on the contrary. And uh, uh, Stefan was uh, insisting on the importance of uh, carrying on long term project from the from the start, I guess. Was that uh, correct? Uh, yes, I think that's, and to address the question, uh, your question, Merwan, I think that's one of the biggest challenge of uh, companies that are establishing uh, a research lab, is to be able to have teams that are working long term, which is very difficult because of the pressure of the everyday life, the pressure coming from the business units, and at the same time, you don't want the researchers to be obviously completely disconnected from the real problem of the company. At the same time, uh, you want them to have time to think and lose time. And this equilibrium is incredibly hard to maintain in a company. There are companies who know how to do that, and there are companies who were never able to do that. And this is part of the culture of a company which has to be acquired. And there are, I mean, many French companies had problems to do that. In Managements are trained to handle the tension between marketing, commercial, finance, development. They are not trained very often to understand the tension between research and development. And when they are not, research is getting absorbed by development. 
So that will be your job. Uh, but you, you, you probably know it. The difficulty uh, of your job is to maintain that. And that strategy has to be adapted to the culture of the company. We all believe that you need long term. But at the same time, we also know many failures. For example, you had all these Japanese companies. I'm thinking of NEC. NEC established a completely isolated lab in the US with telling all the researchers, don't worry, you'll be able to publish. You'll be completely independent. You won't be burdened and so on. The day that NEC began to have financial problem, the lab was closed because they looked and it was not sufficient in terms of production for neck business. So all the extremes have been done. The problem is that if you completely isolate the lab from the company, the day there are financial problem, the lab is closed. So this equilibrium is very hard. That's the only thing that I... Uh, nothing to add. Yeah, I, was, I, was told, I, mean, I was told a couple of years ago, I mean, a couple of weeks ago with Gowning that, that I mean, research was about transforming money into knowledge. And development was about transforming knowledge into money. So of course, <laughs> the, 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 the question is, how do you think you can transfer knowledge into money? OK, so the example which is often given is AT&T with Bell Labs, which had amazing results. On the other hand, it's not a fair example, because AT&T was in a monopoly. And the day the monopoly stopped, they killed Bell Labs. So it, it was not in the usual uh, case. But you do have example, like it seems like Google is able to make it work. They do maintain a research, but they are close. Yeah, and so, and then there is, yes, I, I, it's, for me, it's a living body. Research in a company can die at any time or can survive. It's a result of tension. I don't know any good recipes about that. Uh, in the case of uh, Bell Labs, they had a few uh, emblematic, uh, charismatic uh, researchers, which also at the same time were very aware of the uh, applications and the problems. Take Shannon, who of course was the uh, emblem as well, one was mentioned, and at the same time was uh, devising, carrying up uh, research that was that was uh, inspirational and foundational. So he was inspired by the development and at the same time doing the, the, the research, of course. And uh, the Bell Labs, they understood from early on that it was good that they had some people who would be theoreticians, just no obligation, not in project, but so that they could always be consulted by others or be free to involve others in some of their some of their project. A small number of them, and they were completely integrated at some point. Yeah, I, I would like to comment, because Bell Labs is usually chosen as uh, an example. But it's really a tricky example, because one has to know that AT&T was on a pile of money because of their monopoly. Mm -hmm. The state forced AT&T to do research, to give back to society, and indeed it had a, a feedback. The day AT&T had a cash problem and was transformed into no more monopoly, they killed their research. Mm -hmm. Look at what's happening with uh, Microsoft. Microsoft established a completely free with amazing researchers and so on. Microsoft is getting problems. They closed their labs in, uh, in California. So I'm not so sure that the success of Bell Labs is because they knew, but it's because also it was almost a university. They didn't have any problem of money. So when you are in a company which is completely competitive market, it's much harder to do it than Bell Labs, I think. Yes. Okay. <laughs> of course, the audience can also OK. So uh, uh, several years ago, I uh, worked for um, uh, Actor Lucent, and uh, I contacted with uh, Bellab uh, person researchers. And uh, in my opinion, they do some research. They did some research at uh, is quite uh, independent. It's um, not very close to product. So sometimes, you know, it's. Um, it's not uh, good for business, it's especially for company. And uh, they can uh, get benefit from uh, the research. And uh, I think for Huawei, and uh, especially in uh, FRC, uh, it's some, uh, some kind of things is different. Because you know, we uh, all think about uh, uh, 
uh, product even uh, for next generation product, maybe uh, this not this uh, this generation product, and uh, maybe as a, the future of a product. So that's a good thing for us, and uh, we uh, we uh, how to say connect uh, mathematics to product. It's not only mathematics; it's not only product. We connected uh, them together, and uh, uh, I think it's a good thing because we are here and. Uh, to uh, trying to think uh, how to uh, solve problem, so that's I think that's the important reason for us to to survive in a very you know very hard business environment. So it depends on us how uh, how can uh, contribute to to the product to the future product. Okay. So I think Stefan wanted yeah. to ask it. Then okay, Stefan. Yeah, I just want to give two quick comments. Uh, so. So I've been with Bell Labs for the last five years, um, before I decided to go here. Um, two observations, um, and then we can stop this topic, <laughs> water on the bridge. Um, first of all, they're pretty decoupled from product units. So um, actually, they don't want to talk to product units, product units don't want to talk to them. That has been going on for decades now. So um, mo that has benefits for research. I mean, <coughs> if you're looking for a well-paid postdoc, you can go there do what you want. Um, that has drawbacks for research. Um, you're working with models and under assumptions that you cannot validate by measurements or by contact to people who can do measurements. That's all I wanted to say. Um, this is my experience from the last five years. Um, when I got here um, at, at Huawei, it took colleagues and basically um, um, my, my Chinese friends, it took them about three weeks to bring me in contact with the people who work exactly in the product line on the field I'm, I'm work, I worked on for the last years and where, where I have my, my algorithms, which will now go into products. So the, the company is extremely quick and extremely open for input, even for theoretical work. That was not exactly. Um, but yeah, ba based on the on the work portfolio I brought, brought with me. Sure. Mm -hmm. Then you will also need time to develop completely different ideas. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. There was a question behind. Okay. Um, what is the mathematical tool that, um, according to you, is the most promising for the type of problems that we need to, to solve? Maybe we need to be more specific in the type of problems <laughs> that we need to solve. But um, to me, at least today, um, there are points of uh, um, connections between the three, the four talks. So maybe you can come up you know, with um, some keywords that we need to dig into in the <laughs> I can give some keywords <laughs> well I, I, at least I was impressed I mean I, I, as far as I'm concerned I'm impressed by the number of of dedicated research which is uh, I mean pushed toward learning and uh, and this is one of my other question I mean then we can talk about keywords is is I mean, not why, but I have the feeling that as far as applications are concerned, learning is, is taking a huge part of our, I would say, applied mathematicians in France. And you, is it the case, you think? Or is it because of the big data realm? No? We hear about it all the time, it's a revolution and so on, but it's still a small fraction of uh, uh, people going into learning. At least that is my, that is my uh, understanding of the situation. And uh, putting, setting up the training, the, the masters in which uh, people learn things that will be useful later in learning in big data and so on uh, has been a matter of discussion over the past few years. I don't know if Stefan considers that it is a satisfactory situation now as far as the training goes on. Uh, <clears throat> no, I think like uh, several masters have been created for doing like data, data science and the broader than big data. One is the Saclay and uh, some in uh, Paris and some others, I'm sure. So training is there. 
And clearly, there is not enough people to uh, satisfy the demand uh, from industry. And if you look at, let's say, Google, when they recruit the researchers, the top of the list is indeed machine learning. And there's a strong need uh, and still like, not enough uh, trained students. I think to me the good transfer is mostly through PhD students. So a PhD student that has done a PhD in an university then goes to Huawei, Google, or whatsoever. It's a very, very good way to uh, put some like long-term ideas into companies because they've been trained as PhD students, so they know how to think long-term, and then they can mix this with the uh, short-term um, requirements from companies. Apart from that, if I, if I may say, what we saw in the uh, what we saw in the talks, most of it are mathematical tools which were not developed specifically for uh, for the issues. What is new is the combination, but Wavelet was done uh, long before people were thinking of uh, machine learning. Uh, optimization, gradient flows, all this has been discussed for decades. Entropy has been there for, for a century. And so it's the particular spirit of combination of all these, the idea of working in very large dimension. I mean, people had this idea for a long time, but it remained at theoretical level. Now there is a pressure to have efficient methods in, in large dimension. Uh, it's not uh, really the, the tools, it's the combination, the savoir-faire and the intuition, like it was extremely interesting, I thought, when uh, Stefan was discussing about which group to do now, maybe more, more groups and so on. Of course, harmonic analysis of groups, people have done this for a long time, but not that kind. No, harmonic analysis on groups uh, as a topic, yes, but not that, that, not that kind of question, not invariance along, uh, uh, along groups. But people like uh, Varoupoulos were combining group theory and uh, harmonic analysis already long ago. So to, to uh, okay, I, I'm going to, to answer to, to both questions. The first question is uh, that you asked Merwan, are there many? Uh, I agree with, uh, with Cédric, no, there is not many. And there is a reason. Uh, the mathematics community is by essence a conservative community. We are working on problems that Fermat's theorem is 300 years. We are still reading papers which were published in the 1950s. So there is a good side. When I put up conservative, it's not in a bad side. Behind this thing, it's rooted in the path. So you can't expect that a community which is still dreaming, was dreaming of the Fermat theorem or the Poincaré conjecture is going from the day one to day two, boom, going to switch on this exciting thing. It's a conservative community which moves slowly. And it's, and as, it's not so bad. It's, it's not so bad. I mean, it has the good side of it and the sometime uh, problematic aspect. If you look, for me, it's very striking the difference with the US. Right now in the US for the first time in the, it has happening for the last two years, the number of students enrolling in mathematics is increasing because of this phenomena. A lot of people are moving. In France, they are moving much less. But the trend is going on, in particular in statistics, but I think that this is much broader. There's statistics, there's optimization. These are the first two fields that have moved very strongly, but I think there will be many other fields that will move. Where I pretty strongly disagree with Cédric is on the fact that these are just aggregations of tools. I personally, I don't think so. I think that the range of problems that are in front of us are indeed high dimensional problems treated in a different way. Think of turbulence. It's the problem which has moved the least, both in math, in physics. This is the typical high dimensional problems where there is some low dimensional structures embedded in these very high dimensional problems. The math haven't moved. What, from my point of view, we observe is that engineers have come out with algorithms which are able suddenly to deal with these high dimensional problems. I think that there is a lot of new mathematics to be done. In the kind of thing that I was describing, for example, wavelets are well known on these things. Wavelets have been useless until now to improve results on PD. To I mean, a lot of things have been done, but they've not improved anything since the result of 1930, little with Pele, basically, or the, now, what, if you look at what these engineers are doing, they are doing something very, very nonlinear. 
So the math will have to be worked out, understood, and so on. But for me, it's an opening mathematically. It's going to be much more than just tools. It's about understanding geometry, finding functional spaces of very different nature that can capture geometry in high dimensions, and so on. There are many topics. It will take time for mathematicians to move, but personally, I think it's going, and of course, I'm completely biased. About the question you asked to, to, to express the bias. When you ask a researcher, what do you think is the most important tool? The response is what I'm doing right now, okay? <laughs> so, I'm completely biased, I accept. Still, I believe that the field as a whole is going to bring a lot. We can, why did I give the example of physics? is to show that it's touching very fundamental things in these areas. If these algorithms are able to learn, it means that they were somewhere able to project in low dimensions something which is believed to be a very high dimensional object. They captured something at a mathematical level. So I think it's uh, overall uh, deep areas. And the wonderful thing is that a lot of observation comes from engineering. Engineering is very much in advance on math on this area right now. Uh, a comment, by the way, about the uh, wavelet story. As you see, of course, there is little wood pili, which goes back to the to the thirties and and so on. But uh, wavelet theory, as developed by uh, Meyer and other people recently, was uh, partly inspired by uh, industry, also in particular petrol detection, uh, etc. So in this case, also, it was engineer savoir-faire turned into mathematical theory uh, to some extent. It was meeting. So, so maybe I would like to add something. So, so computer science is often forgotten in all of our discussions, and part of the department of Ecole Normale, I have to uh, say something. I don't make a big distinction between CS and math. To me, it's all like a big, big blur. But computational thinking is important. Okay, we deal with computers, we deal with lots of data, and doing math without a small amount of computational thinking and thinking about algorithms, I think, is a big problem. So. Training in France is not so good uh, in this, like for algorithms. The point is math, of course, but algorithms are also important, and I'm biased because I'm doing algorithms. But this is, uh, I think, to me, like mathematics and computer science uh, in, in a very broad, broad sense. And of course, curvature is the most important of all. <laughs> And around the matrices, of course. Uh, so uh, you're raising the question of training, which is a good question. So a lot of my um, uh, colleagues from Huawei always raise the question of, of, first, why is France so good in mathematics? The main reason. And second, is this trend going to be still the case in the next years? As you know, I mean, uh, all other countries in the world are also investing and reforming their education perspective. So what's your thought on, on, on the training that we have in France in mathematics? And do you think it's still going to be continuing this way or, or not? So, I, I mean, about the training, I mean, there are two different issues. Is uh, If the system is able to produce um, the, uh, a reasonable amount of people with uh, 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 a, a little knowledge in math uh, to, um, or is the system able to produce uh, 20 uh, very good researchers every year? And so it's n not the same question. And I, I would say that at the moment I don't fear too much for research at the top level. Each time I see uh, uh, all the, rec the, the recent PhDs, uh, which are so good, and I mean, so it's really quite, still quite impressive. So um, <coughs> I, I really think the system is still adapt for uh, fundamental research and top level research. We fear more for uh, the uh, more average uh, level in mathematics in France uh, because uh, the programs uh, are not uh, as exigent uh, as in the past. Uh, I think there is a good start where new subjects with more uh, probabilities and more statistics, and this is very positive. But uh, also, uh, 
very the lost in the exigence of, uh, of the quality and uh, what is approved. Uh, so I, I think we are losing something, maybe not for the top level research. But, uh, I kind of agree, yes. And uh, it's true that uh, mathematical education is not an easy thing for any country. Um, any uh, kind of uh, reform which is uh, directed from top and uh, based on pedagogical uh, science mainly is almost sure to fail. At least we have many examples of this. And uh, uh, the, of course, the big issue is where to get the good teachers, where to get them motivated and so on. In the past uh, few years, this was our main concern in France. Lack of uh, teachers, of good teachers that uh, we could hire. For two years in a row, it was numbers were crazily bad. Then uh, last year, I heard it was not so not so bad. And uh, next year, not not clear at all. So it's very uh, indicated that is very sensitive to 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 watch and to monitor here. I would like to go back to a point I think Stefan Mala uh, mentioned before, um, which is the understanding of machine learning. Um, so far, it seems to me that, I mean, of course, we have these fu fundamental techniques, stochastic approximation, if you want, support vector machines, wavelets to some extent, or understanding of Gaussian processes, but everything else, like parameterizing these boxes, is more or less magic or basically experience, okay? So there is a gap seeing this as a whole. So, and you mentioned before, you said something interesting. Algorith algorithms can provide us with insight, like, you know, the typical working model, theoretical and, and applied physicists have, that the applied guys try to prove the theoretical models of, of the theoretical physicists and the other way around. Um, so my question to you is, um, if you now could wish from us what would you like us to study? Which evidence you need? Um, which type of results or justifications you need from the algorithmic point of view, from the experiments, to allow you to establish a systematic on machine learning, on training machine learning? Big question, I know, but maybe we can carve a bit on it. start with the basic answer. So to me, what I'm interested in is problems you face uh, linked with your data. And if you have a problem, it means that there's something to do uh, with it for research. So it's very, very bottom-up. So I believe a lot in bottom-up problems. But maybe like my colleagues have a more top-down approach where they have a bigger scheme. But for me, it's really like, talk to me about your data, and then we can see what to do. Uh, I. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to say why we don't understand. We have to realize that the problem that machine learning is attacking are problems that we don't understand either physically or mathematically. Analyzing an image or an audio signal is again by far as difficult as analyzing the property of a turbulent signal, which we don't know how to do, either with the standard math tools or physical tools. So. The problems that machine learning is attacking are problems which are completely at the frontier of science or beyond the frontier of science. So what I believe is that there is not the tools. It's not because people in machine learning are doing a crummy uh, uh, work about analyzing what they are doing. It's because they are working on incredibly complicated high dimensional problem on which we have a hard time to understand what are the concepts. At the end, it will boil down to low dimensions. Somewhere, if you can do estimation, that means that you've been able to structure your problem to bring it to low dimension, which is ultimately the goal of a mathematical or physical analysis to understand how to attack the problem, factorize it so that you can extract a low dimensional structure out of it. But we just don't know how to do it on these problems right now, which are non-Gaussian problems. So it's not very surprising that we don't know how to explain. So for me, that's why I'm saying, for me, it's a beautiful frontier. For me, it's going to be a meeting 
of these two point of view by working at the intersection, but I really don't think, because you know, there is a little bit that saying is, oh, people in machine learning, they're just a bunch of algorithmic guy who don't care about understanding. I don't think it's true. I just think it's very hard. The math are very difficult. Everything is very difficult. They're trying, but nobody knows. It's just a frontier of research. Uh, I would like to uh, make a comment, even though not, not answering the question, but making side comment. The, the question that Stefan was uh, asking at some point in the talk, like, why does it work so well, is also a question that a few years ago, specialists of Monte Carlo Markov chains were uh, asking at some point. The big revolution in algorithms and optimization was Monte Carlo Markov chains. It changed the life of people in physics, in biology, all, all these things. And we still don't know why they uh, work so well. I remember Percy Diaconis telling me, understanding why MCMC methods are so power powerful is one of the biggest uh, things, one of the biggest things in science nowadays. He did himself, by the way, establish some uh, estimates on a crazily simplified model with a crazily bad rate and so on. So we are, we are uh, so far from it. Uh, of course, the uh, optimistic view, as expressed by uh, Stefan, is there's a deep reason up there. We'll have some big mathematical understanding at some point and understand some structure and really understand it, not just witnessing the fact that it uh, always works. Okay, uh, maybe a last question to Stefan related to your startup experience uh, that you've been making. Um, I was wondering, was the original ideas you had, that, or I would say innovative ideas, which are mathematic oriented, because you've been uh, uh, working a lot on wavelets, were they pushed within your startup, or was it at the end something else that, that made it? You know the answer, that's why you asked the question. I think there is always this naive idea for a researcher or an entrepreneur to think that the idea he has is the idea that is going to make his startup be an amazing success. It's like for a researcher, and it never ends up that way. So of course, we began with a very nice result. We thought we were going to conquer the world without. And on the way, we realized this very nice result is not powerful enough, nobody cares about it, and so on, and blah, 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 and we changed. I think what is important is the know-how is we had a know-how in applied math, we had many tools, and the day we found the right problem, the right mar market, and we, with the know-how we had, we could develop a solution that other people didn't have. And, and the path we had done before was useful for it. So the short answer is it was not the bandlet theorem that we had at the end that went into the chip. But it was the know-how we had around all this thing that allowed us to have a chip more efficient than Samsung, Intel, and so on, on this little problem. And, and in terms of building a team together, the human side? Yeah, and there is the team. That, but which we do, it's like in a lab. A lab or a group is a group of people. And that's something that you build when doing a... a for me, building a startup or building a research group is the same thing. Building a big company has nothing to do, but a startup of 20 people or research group of 20 people, it's the same spirit, it's the same excitations, and so on, yeah. when there is. Okay, so that, that's definitely a good message. Meaning from the original idea, it didn't work, but the team was smart enough to find another application and another also problem to which to apply it. And I think, yeah, we'll be finishing right now because I think there's also a bus who has to take uh, the lab. So I'm very happy that we could co-organize with Emmanuel and uh, the, uh, this, this workshop and also for all the, the plenary speakers who took the time to come here. And uh, Cédric, also this morning, I think it was a bit of a hassle. <laughs> Uh, driving back here and, and all and the others we also I mean uh, cordially invite you when you have time and know you have a busy schedule to visit us in our lab and also give talks or or just have a coffee we have a nice coffee machine in fact we have two coffee machines <laughs> but <laughs> in any case so I like uh, so I think there's no question I think I hope you enjoyed also the day and uh, hopefully we'll do it also for next year then another workshop altogether okay let's thank the speakers Thank you.